This is a maxillary right first molar with a 9 millimeter pocket on the distofacial root and furcation involvement. We're going to extract this tooth, first using a 15C blade to go around the PDL, a couple of millimeters, buccal and lingual. Periosta elevator to release the flap with the periosteum intact on the flap. A coarse diamond to cut through the crown. Remove the crown. This is a Comet H254 carbide in an NSK 1 to 5 speed increasing handpiece. This fits on an implant motor, this handpiece, and uses the sterile saline. No air comes out of that handpiece, so it's used uh, for extractions. Elevate the roots after they're separated and remove them with a straight beaked forcep. Being very careful not to disturb the facial plate. This is the palatal root being elevated coronally with a larger straight elevator. Once the coronal movement is established it's easy to extract the tooth, the root. A molt number two angled curette is used to clean out any granulation tissue and a scaler to get the calculus off of the second molar. This is that same burr, the comet burr and it's very smooth, so it's used to actually smooth down and plane the root. There's a distal, de there's a mesial defect on that uh, number two molar, so this is also cleaning out that uh, defect to get down the sound bone. And we use that same number two angle to actually release the periosteum on the facial flap, and on the palatal flap we use a number four, which has a little bit broader blade, as you can see here, for the heavier tissue to undermine the tissue and release the periosteum with that flap. Notice no vertical releasing incisions were placed and by using this curette you can get underneath there and undermine it pretty well. So here's the area, there's a nice size uh, furcation area, interceptal area. So we're going to place the implant right there. Using that same comet burr just to get a purchase point to start the osteotomy right in the middle. Now we're going to start with the cast kit which is the uh, crustal approach sinus kit by us and we're going to use a twist drill, a number two twist drill with a number three stopper which allows only three millimeters of the drill to stick up so it's a depth limiting stopper. We go into the next one which is the actual cast drill which is 2.8 using that same three millimeter stopper as a special tip to it, a round tip it's not a cutting tip like a uh, twist drill would be. And we slowly progress up to the next size, one millimeter at a time, so the number four stopper with that same 2.8. Now we go to the number five stopper with the 2.8. You can see there's uh, still bone there. Now we're going to go to the 3.1 cast drill with the number six stopper to enlarge the osteotomy and go a little bit deeper, one millimeter deeper. Now we go to the 3.3 .3 with the seven millimeter stopper. There again, just enlarging slowly and progressing one millimeter towards the sinus. Because, uh, now we go to the eight, because you have a good view of this, I'm not using any depth gauge yet. I can actually see that it hasn't reached the bone. Now we're almost there. You can see some of the gray, so we're getting very close to the sinus. I'm going to check now with the depth gauge using that same stopper, the number eight stopper, and it still feels solid bone. It's not uh, has not reached the sinus quite yet. So we go to the next size stopper, which is the number nine, using this, the same 3.3 cast drill, and now I can feel that I've gotten through. So I pick up the depth gauge and I can feel a little bit of uh, sponginess, a little like a trampoline effect. I know I'm up against the membrane. And you see a close up and you see the difference. Now you see that there's some, uh, you can see the bleeding because I'm actually through and I haven't perfed the membrane but I'm, I can feel that I'm through the bone. Now I'll use the membrane lifter which is a uh, autoclavable silicone attached to a saline syringe and 
I'm going to be placing this. This is soft that it seals up into the osteotomy. And once I have it placed, the assistant then stabilizes it. And then using 0.5 cc increments, I will inject up into that and raise the sinus membrane. The first increment is 0.5 cc, done twice, followed by 1 cc, also injected twice. And we withdraw the saline after each injection. This is a view that was done through a lateral endoscopic uh, window of a casket uh, by Dr. Cho at uh, the 2011 World Symposium, showing how it lifts the sinus membrane. So this is the sterile saline, and we're going to use that to hydrate the osteos mineralized freeze-dried combination cortical cancellous powder. And we're using the powder because we don't want it to clog the osteotomy. Um, if you inject uh, chips, it tends to clog as you try to push up the chips into the uh, sinus area. So the powder has much smaller uh, dimension to it. Gradually drain off the uh, saline and then screw, uh, unscrew that yellow cap and then you see the bone ready to go and this is used as the dispenser for the bone. That's the bone condenser that's part of the cast kit with that same 9 millimeter stopper that reached the sinus, just making sure it fits in there passively, and then I apply a little bit of bone. The key is not to put a lot of bone in each time, otherwise it'll clog up, you'll never get it up to the, uh, to the sinus, it'll clog up into the osteotomy. Now we're gently packing the bone. This has to be repeated several times, but in small increments each time. And now you'll see the view from the endoscope that was at the uh, symposium. And this is showing you what it looks like as the bone is packed in there. So you can see you get a good amount of lift as well as width. So it's not just height, but width when, when this uh, hydraulic system is used to raise the sinus. At this point, we use the bone spreader which is on that same, using that same stopper at 30 RPM, same 9 millimeter stopper that was used to make sure that no instrument goes beyond the amount that was raised with the cast drill. That just moves the bone around a little bit. Now the assistant's dropping the implant from a distance so the inner vial, now that's sterile, and I'm going to pop the cap off. and pop the smaller cap off. This comes straight off, but I'm doing it with my left hand, and then in my right hand I have the fixture mount on the handpiece. Pick up the implant, hold the vial upside down, and just gently withdraw the implant. This is a 4.5 by 11.5 IOSIN ET3. Tell the patient to open. Make sure you don't want to hit anything. Just go right from the vial right to the osteotomy without touching anything else. Slow speed, tapping speed, 30 RPM with no uh, saline. Here's a hand driver to get it to seat all the way. Now we're going to place the cover screw. There again, I hold the vial on my left hand, pop off the cover screw lid with the little hand wrench, pick up the cover screw, and because the hand wrench has a, is, wet, is um, tapered, it wedges on so that the screw does not fall off the wrench. And then we can take it to the implant and tighten it down with finger pressure only. A little extra bone is placed to fill some of the socket area and to fill in any of the little defects. Also the defect at the mesial of the second molar is filled in. Now we're going to be measuring the distance between the two teeth using the sliding caliper. We unlock the jaw, then spread it so that each jaw is against the tooth, and then lock the thumb screw so the caliper doesn't move. A non-resorbable membrane, PTFE, is being used. Gently peel it back. Take the sliding caliper. And since the jaws are locked, just make marks. And this will define the width 
of the PTFE membrane that we want to make. So you just basically connect the dots with the scissors, being careful to keep the edges rounded. You don't want a 90 degree edge. So as you come around, just make sure that the edge is rounded. And using that same number two molt curette, I'm tucking in the membrane. I first went into the palatal flap and I'm bringing it over and I'm tucking it into the facial flap. It's now at least five millimeters on each side, down each flap, to hold it in place. 4-0 Vicryl with an FS2 needle, and we start that at the mesiofacial corner from the outside of the flap in, being careful not to catch the membrane. Then we go to the midpoint of the palatal flap with the needle, then the midpoint of the facial flap, and you can see it here. So I'm not at the very end, I'm at the midpoint of it because it's a pretty broad flap. Then I'm going to take it and go to the distal palatal corner. Assistant hands me the needle, that's the transfer. And then go to the distofacial corner. You don't over tighten it, you just tighten it gently. straightening out the suture so you can see how it's crossing and now the last one will cross over to the mesiopalatal corner the last suture so here is the mesiopalatal corner assistant has a better angle so hands me the needle being careful not to touch the tip. You don't want to dull the tip. So you grab it at about a millimeter at least down from the tip. Sutures and snip. And using a non-woven 2x2 two two sponge. You don't want the cotton filled. You don't want to have any cotton particles. Just gently Squeeze the flap, get out any hematoma that might have formed. You can see it has good adaptation there. And there's, as I said, at least five millimeters of the membrane on either side of that flap, facial and palatal. So here you can see the uh, implant raised the sinus about three millimeters, and the top of the implant is about two millimeters deeper than the interproximal height of the crest of bone at the distal of the premolar. So sutures come out in two weeks, membrane in 30 days.